Hello all, this is the Owl, and today, something different. Well, not exactly. Yes, it's another Mage and Abyss video, but we're not going to talk about the plot, the art, the structure, or anything of that nature. Instead, I'm going to focus on something that I found really, really interesting, and that is a variety of theories about where exactly Tsukushi got some of his ideas from. As, yeah, so often happens on this channel, this ended up being one long ass script, and as I won't keep my non deep dive videos under 30 minutes, I am going to split this into two. Today, we'll look at the various creatures within the abyss and what zoological specimens and odd creatures inspired them. Then we'll look at the curse and its possible inspirations, as well as a few other things about Tsukushi personally. The next one will be a bit wibbly-wobbly fan theory e, as we'll be delving into the possible mythological and theological inspirations behind the story. Anyway, enough rambling. Let's dive right on in. The inspirations behind fauna within the abyss range from very obvious to quite subtle, and naturally, I'm not going to go over every single creature. I mean, yeah, orb pierces, obviously a porcupine or a hedgehog. Ugh, man, that's cursed. Split jaws, duh, obviously a snake. And that's obviously a virus. And that's obviously... no, I have no bloody idea. And then we get to the interesting ones. Let's take a look at, hmm, four of my favorites. First up, our old friends, the Turbinid Dragons. Almighty Elphas of Layer 6, so powerful that even the awakened, white balancing enhanced Vaputa couldn't take one out. But what in the name of Lovecraft's butthole inspired these? Well, let's start with etymology. In Japanese, these are called Ryu Sazai, although I've also heard it said Ryu Sasai. Ryu means dragon. Easy peasy, and that's fairly obvious. Sasai means lesser or slight, but when I see this written in katakana, generally it's Sazai, which uh, I wish I had access to the kanji for this, as this could be a reference to Sazaido, literally Turban Shell Tower, a legendary rotating structure from the Edo period that makes its way into a fair bit of classic Japanese art. Or perhaps it's a reference to Miso Sazai, a species of bird, i.e. a wren, which, if you're willing to stretch, does sort of make sense. The English version is just as interesting. Turbinid is an obscure biological term for things from the snail family, and also possibly a play on Turban Shell Tower. Turbinid, Turban Shell, I'm guessing here. But the snail reference does also make sense. The head, though, is very avian, reminding me quite a bit of a vulture. And the turbinate dragon is also known for puking up balls of, well, puke, and then gobbing them at enemies with devastating force, as for Puta learned the hard way. Damn it, but that scene was grisly, and I wonder how gory this is going to be in the anime. Like, there's no way they can show this, right? There are also a handful of birds that use offensive vomiting, most notably the turkey vulture and the fulmar, which, when threatened, can project a stream of oil, reeking half-digested fish and acid quite a distance. Apparently this sticks, bonds to skin and clothing, and will make you stink for weeks. That's both gross and metal as all hell. If you've read Garth Ennis's The Boys, you may remember this scene. Blah. I think I just threw up in my own stomach. 
So yeah, turbinate dragons. Aptly named and very interesting beasties. I really hope we get to fight one in the game. Next creature, Mania. This adorable and yet somehow still off-putting creature was introduced way back when the party first encountered Bondrood and his adoptive daughter Prushka at Edor Front. Prushka's little pet Mania confers a resistance to the curse via its odor and also helped her go from basically being catatonic to being the loving daughter slash cartridge slash whistle this manga man she is. But forget Prushka, what the hell is Mania? Well, in an interview, Takushi claimed that he based it off a stinky parrot that his family owned when he was a kid. And yeah, you can definitely see the parrot inspirations, especially in the anime adaptation, as Mania awkwardly flaps around, making that weird cawing sound that is its namesake. I think there might also be a guinea pig in there somewhere, or maybe a hamster, and I base that on absolutely nothing concrete. Next up, the Amaranthine Deceptors. As a lifelong Zerg main, for the swarm! I just love swarmy, insectile critters, and these things are just too freaking cool in how nasty they are. Found in the lowest layers of the abyss, these busy little hellbugs are starting to make their way up higher, taking control of areas of upper layers, and they are bloody dangerous, mostly due to their life cycle. See, these things infest living creatures, including humans with their larvae, and they then keep the victim alive for as long as possible as a hideous incubator. It is hinted that these are going to play a big role in the story later on, and yeah, I'm pretty stoked. The clearest inspiration for these is parasitoid wasps, who have a very similar life cycle. Be warned, some gross ass bug stuff ahead. These fascinating critters date back to the Jurassic period, and when they find a suitable host, deposit their eggs either into or onto living creatures, although they don't infest people. At least, I hope they don't. What makes them particularly interesting is that some species make use of specific viruses injected along with larvae, which manage the host's immune system and biological functions to keep it alive for as long as possible and prevent the death of the larvae. There are also tons of bugs that imitate leaves and flowers, but the design of these does remind me most of all of mantids. Finally, Faputa. Oh yeah, my absolute favorite Maiden Abyss character, and one of my favorite manga characters of all time. And no, not because she likes to groove out with her boobs out. The tragic, mercurial Princess of the Hollows has one of the most fascinating designs in the story, going from some of the cutest, funniest panels. <laughs> Seriously, surprised for Puta Face, someone really needs to meme this, as it makes me chuckle whenever I see it, to some of the most threatening, disturbing, and gruesome moments, as well as, yeah, that panel. Damn it, I want to frame this and put it on my wall. Her design, though, I'll admit that this one took me a while to piece together, but let's give it a try. First up, there's definitely some owl in there. The large eyes, the expressions, the way she puffs herself up when threatened, and a lot of her head movements make me think owl, and the way that she's constantly going from round shapes to tall pointy shapes and back again makes me wonder if she was partially inspired by the famous transforming owl. Yeah, remember that meme from 20 years ago? That's from Japan. And now I just made myself feel old. But there are also a lot of people who call her a moth. And 
after a bit of googling, yeah, I see it now. What I thought were multiple tails are actually more reminiscent of the wings and form of the adorable poodle moth, a mysterious and mostly unstudied moth from Venezuela. And yeah, this is especially noticeable around her head, her wings, you know, those floofy things behind her, and her hands, which, without her talon deployed, do resemble a moth's paws, legs, little feety things. I am not a biologist. Finally, and probably principally, Faputa is a fox. And yes, I'm sure someone's going to clip that out of context. But I'm serious. Not only are foxes often depicted as having more fluid forms, and not infrequently, having the ability to straight up shapeshift, Japanese mythology is weird, yo. A lot of Faputa's behaviors and defined anatomy are almost certainly vulpine in nature. For starters, she has a scent gland around her butt area, which explains her habit of rubbing her, well, lady bits up against things to mark them. And no, I probably can't show you that on YouTube. It looks suggestive. This explains probably the single funniest line in the manga too. Beyond this, a lot of her body language is very fox-like. She hisses at things when scared and arches her back, bounds around to play, and as anyone familiar with domesticated foxes will confirm, she likes to climb up onto people's heads as a safe vantage point to rest. No, I'm not kidding, foxes love to do this. It's pretty adorable, like a floofy, stinky hat. So, that's it for zoology, but okay, what about the abyss itself? While the roots of the abyss probably lie more in mythology and theology, there are some aspects of it that probably do have at least some real-world inspirations. But what, you ask, could have inspired this massive, underground, Lovecraftian world? Well, let me see if I can explain. The most notable inspiration is likely the ocean. Quite a few Maiden Abyss creatures are very clearly inspired by deep sea nightmares. Mitty, for instance, is maybe 70% blobfish and 30% a butt crack that someone glued googly eyes to. And the Fuso Shepu, somewhere between an octopus and a jellyfish, maybe, but probably. The most intriguing aspect is the curse that permeates the various layers, inflicting a variety of awful symptoms onto anyone that attempts to ascend back out. Now, see if you follow me, because this was my first thought when I heard about the curse, and I'm maybe 90% sure that I know where it came from. As anyone who's been deep sea diving before knows, there is a certain phenomenon that can occur when you ascend from the depths. This has a variety of names, such as Kaisen disease, decompression sickness, and most commonly, the bends. Ascending from a deep, highly pressurized environment, especially if you do it too fast, can cause various gases to escape from your tissues and screw with your entire body. This can hit all sorts of organs, which means the symptoms are wide and varied, including excruciating pain, nausea, unconsciousness, blindness, hallucinations, delusions, hemorrhaging, death, and horrible mutations. I'm just kidding about the last one, unless you're diving near a nuclear reactor or something. But this should sound quite familiar to you now. And the last thing I'm going to mention today is Iruburu. No, I refuse to say Ilbu. That just sounds uh, so wrong to me. Specifically, 
the sequence where the party first arrives, and Rico attempts to navigate the marketplace and figure out how it all works. But she nearly ends up getting into hot water, and it's a wonderfully anxiety-inducing sequence. This is a fear that mangaka quite often explore, a protophobia of impropriety in foreign settings, and in Tsukushi's case, this was allegedly inspired by a visit to, I think it was Malaysia, but I forget, and the feeling of being lost and utterly overwhelmed, unable to communicate, and constantly making faux pas in a foreign land. It's a feeling that I'm sure a lot of us can identify with, especially if you travel and work in other countries. So, that's the end of this one. Next time, we'll take a look at the theological and mythological inspirations for Maiden Abyss, as well as two actual doomed expeditions that I believe inspired quite a few aspects of the story. Until then, take care my friends. If you enjoyed this, why not stick around? There's plenty more like this and tons coming down the pipe, a lot of which I am legit excited to show you. If you want to help us out, or allow me to buy a PC that doesn't sound like a jumbo jet in the background, yeah, that weird noise, that's my PC. Don't blame me, it's old and it's like 32 degrees right now. You could always head over to our Patreon. And if you want to come and shoot the shit, give me feedback or make requests, you could always come and visit us on our Discord. Otherwise, cheers, see you next time, this is The Owl, signing off.